Investors Chronicle. It's the Companies and Markets show. It's Thursday, the 4th of April, as we record. The days are getting longer. It's finally stopped raining for an hour or two, and we approach today's show in that same spirit of optimism. Our cover feature this week is very much along those lines, looking at how investors can play the travel rebound. So we'll be discussing that later on and ask how long said rebound can persist. We're also going to be looking at interest rate cuts. When will they happen? Will they happen? All that and more to come later on in the show too. Before all that, however, we are going to start on a slightly gloomier note with Tesla, the magnificent seven stock that's gone awry in 2024, share price wise at least. A big cast of characters with me today to discuss all of this. Uh, over the line, we have Julian Hoffman. Hi, Julian. Hello there, Dan. <clears throat> and in the studio, we have Hermione Taylor. Hi, Dan. Mark Robinson. Good morning. Alex Newman. Hello. And Chris Akers. Hi, Dan. Hi, everyone. We're going to get straight on. We've got a busy show. Uh, Tesla, Mark, will come to you. Some simple stats, I suppose, to, to begin. Look at the last one year. Look at the Magnificent Seven. You've got NVIDIA, 200%. Meta, over 100% up. Alphabet and Amazon, 50 to 70% up. Microsoft, much the same. Apple, more or less flat. We've discussed Apple before. Tesla, however, down 12% down almost a third year to date. What has been going wrong for the electric vehicle manufacturer, Mark? It, it might relate to solely to Tesla, but uh, the market itself is uh, undergoing something of an upheaval at the present time. Demand levels have trailed away, particularly in the United States as well. A lot of people are laying this at the door of the, the usual technical or practical issues linked to the uh, EV transition, we're looking at things like uh, range and uh, a dearth of infrastructure. But I, I, I personally think that there's resistance to, uh, to the transition is being developed through the, the viability or, the, or lack thereof of the second-hand car market uh, for EVs. There's clear questions over depreciation rates now and, in fact, after sales uh, servicing and infrastructure costs as well, which is a problem. And I, and I think all this has contributed to a, 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 an increased reluctance on the part of motorists themselves. It's particularly noticeable, as I said, in the US. And, I, you know, the, the, the problems with Tesla, aside from the fact you alluded that they have a, they have to contend with a, with a tech rating down through the years as well, is their level of indebtedness, but we, we, we've said this all along, and there's been a lot of very rosy assumptions baked into the valuation down through the years as well. I mean, you know, I was, I was thinking at one point that it might fall under the category of, like, too big to fail. But you, you, you've got a situation at the moment where other, uh, you know, legacy automakers are struggling because of their EV units, Obviously, um, GM and Ford in the US. The management at Toyota expressed reservations over the transition as early as uh, February last year, uh, and so this this is just the end result. I wouldn't say it was necessarily uh, predictable, and it may have something to do with the, the fact that expectations were so high for the company itself. But it comes, you know, he he seemed he, Elon Musk as well seems to be in the crosshairs because of other issues as well, not least his uh, takeover bit of X. Um, but, yeah, it's um, it, it's a sit situation that we, we were seeing at the moment. Other manufacturers are tending to prioritise the development of hybrids as well. And who's to say over time that won't lead to a switch in uh, government mandates and policy? Mm -hmm. We've had the latest figures this week as well, the, the latest production figures, which I think they posted sales of around 400,000, slightly below in the first three months of fiscal 2024, which was about 50,000 below expectations. Uh, it did, however, enable it to retake the EV crown from BYD, the uh, Chinese manufacturer, which we also write about this week in print, uh, which has seen its own sales slow. However, Mark, I think it's fair to say that BWD is a big 
a thorn in Tesla's side, as it is in many car makers' side at the moment, uh, it seems. It's been cutting prices quite considerably in China. Uh, there is this sense as well that Tesla's current lineup is slightly stale in terms of the newness of its uh, models. Uh, you know, there's some slight saturation there too. So even though BYD has had its own problems, it's still that indicative really of that greater competition as well in a in a market that may be, if not contracting, then seeing growth rates slow. Yeah, as we, in the US, we've certainly moved beyond the point where there was an initial surge of interest in, in electric vehicle technology. So it might be part of a, a natural process in that regard. With BYD as well, as you mentioned, they've uh, been doing some pretty heavy discounting uh, of their own. Slightly different from Tesla in, in a sense. There, there could be a regulatory angle developing here as well because obviously the last thing that um, Western government governments want is a sort of uh, a, a domination of uh, cheaper uh, uh, Chinese electric vehicles in the market. The European Commission recently said that uh, it had evidence that uh, Chinese, the Chinese government was effectively subsidising the EV industry uh, in Europe through what they term direct transfer of funds uh, and other means. Donald Trump has also said that uh, he would impose tariffs on EV imports into the United States if uh, the production process didn't involve any uh, US workers. So there's growing uh, political uh, resistance uh, uh, to uh, Chinese manufacturing ambitions. How this plays out over time is difficult to say. Also, you alluded to the fact that uh, Tesla's models themselves are, are aging now. The, the tech's aging, but uh, I think more to the point as well, they've lost the uh, it's not seen as an exclusive uh, product any longer, and it's lost its cachet in that regard. Whether that's had an effect on sales is difficult to say, but uh, certainly they're going to be facing more competition in the future. On on, on the um, on the price cutting front as well, uh, in, in, for Tesla, I mean they they've obviously sacrificing uh, margins in a bid to shore up uh, their market share as well. And this has echoes of uh, Jeff Bezos and, and Amazon, slightly different set of circumstances, admittedly. It, you know, you could even say that it, it's a, another sign of market distortion as well, the fact that so early on in the piece they've had to resort to this to, uh, to shore up those, uh, the market share too. It could even uh, relate to this issue of depreciation I, I pointed to before, uh, this isn't being talked about that much, but I, I, I generally think that this is one of the ma major reasons why we're seeing a slowdown as well. It's just uncertainties of, you know, if you drive off a forecourt in a conventional vehicle, you'll get, you know that you're going to lose 18% the moment you get off the forecourt, right? Uh, but you'll have a fairly good idea what that car uh, will be worth in a couple of years' time. That's not the case with EVs at the moment. So, you know, you're not going to be buying into them if you think two years hence that suddenly it's worth half of the purchase price. Um, I think that that will become more evident uh, as time progresses. The other uncertainty with EVs, aside from the wider uncertainty over the speed of the transition, which is clearly uh, fueling part of this drop in Tesla's share price, no pun intended, is, is the environmental effects. And they, Tesla were affected by an environmentalist attack on uh, the uh, uh, Berlin factory, I think, because increasingly EVs are being seen as, in many ways, big pollutants themselves in terms of, you know, we've discussed things before, like the batteries and the environmental footprint and the water usage, things like that. And uh, I'm sure people would say, don't like perfect, be the enemy of good. But at the same time, the, that's another uncertainty into the piece, the fact that people you might think would be a natural ally or even a natural uh, market for EVs are uh, really sort of turning against them in that way. It's not like I'm not suggesting we're going to see a mass disruption of factories more so than we do with the average car maker, but but even that kind of string to their bow is being questioned now as well. Uh, Julian, what, what's your thought on on Tesla in general and its current fortunes? Uh, if you like me and you um, uh, you subscribe to the great man of history theory, <laughs> I think in this respect, uh, Marcus definitely a Marxist. Um, I would say that 
uh, you can't get away from the fact that Tesla's problems also come down to the person who's leading it. Um, uh, some of their activists, or some of their more bullish investors recently came out against uh, Musk for, for a lot of his pronouncements. And there is some evidence that that is putting people off the shares, if not perhaps the the underlying story of, uh, of uh, Tesla's offering. But um, it, it, it is such an erratic share price and erratic uh, seeming company anyway that it, it, perhaps you can't measure it as um, you can't perhaps you can't just look at it as a normal company on its own. You just have to consider that it is going to be very, very, very volatile in whichever direction you you point it. Um, so that's definitely one point to to make there. And and secondly, there is just there is an increasing debate, uh, as you've alluded to, really, that um, the car industry has misallocated a lot of resources over the last two to three years, and um, that they're seeing far more capacity than there is market for electric vehicles at the moment. And uh, that is going to lead to quite painful readjustment of, you know, as they kind of try to balance that off again. So um, it's not all Musk's fault, it's not all Tesla's fault, but there's definitely an element of that uh, investors don't trust what he does or says anymore in a, in, in a kind of broad sense. Mm. You're right. The, the the shares have always been quite volatile, certainly more so than any other magnificent seven member. But they are being lumped in together now, and this is probably a reminder this year that the companies are all all very different. I suppose the bull case, you know, to go back to price cuts, they are reportedly looking at a even cheaper car for 2025. So that would be a new model, and if that exclusivity has already gone, then maybe leaning into the affordable side of things might be something that can pick them back up. And and people have written Tesla off before and shorted Tesla for a long time, very unsuccessfully. So that's not to say the company won't pick up again. But uh, I think in the past, I mean, that's, you know, early on in the narrative as well, that related to their accumulation of debt and how that was going to be serviced over time. Then it came down to their production levels and they certainly trumped the market in that regard. This time, though, it's a, it's a slightly... A different aspect, giving the increased competition in the market and uh, the general theme of uh, reluctance on the part of consumers. Mm. It's pretty hard to uh, legislate against that that last issue as well. And in general terms, I always, I always think it comes down to the fact that it's very difficult to mandate markets generally uh, from my uh, pure Iron Rand perspective. Wow, that's probably a good time to uh, move on to the next segment. Chris. You wrote the cover feature this week on travel, the travel rebound. Can we talk a bit about the the thinking behind it? I mean, I've described it in some ways there, but there's no doubt there has been this big surge in travel demand over the last couple of years for quite obvious reasons. But nonetheless, the extent of that demand has taken some people by surprise. Yeah, so the thinking behind the piece, I noticed this trend of many travel and leisure companies reporting record trading, record results, which I thought was pretty interesting given the, the, the narrative of the cost of living crisis and struggling consumers. But as you mentioned, Dan, a demand has surged in post-pandemic times. So, so doing some digging into those trends was how, how things started. And then I noticed quite a few uh, cheap valuation opportunities across the sector as well um, that I think investors have to consider. So it really was a combination of strong trading, strong demand and, and valuation options that... that got the piece started and the thinking behind it. This idea of revenge spending is something we've heard a lot in the last couple of years as people take the trips that they couldn't take beforehand. We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute and maybe the cyclical versus structural drivers there. As it stands, though, one thing that's interesting to look at is companies that are back at pre-pandemic baselines in terms of the metrics of their business and those that are approaching it, those that are still lagging maybe. What what kind of examples do we have on that front? Yeah, so I'll just pick out a couple of companies um, here. Uh, one of our favourites in, in the travel and leisure space is Premier Inn owner Whitbread, which trades at quite a cheap valuation. So, it's, yeah, it stands out in the hotel sector for having an occupancy rate ahead of pre-pandemic levels, and that compares to other listed hotel operators we look at in the future, which are still behind, um, even if very slightly in some cases. It's important to mention, though, for, for hotels, uh, PwC, as I mentioned in the piece, thinks the key 
revenue per available room metric will be flat in London and fall in the regions this year. So yeah, very company specific there with Whitbread. Thinking about the airlines as another example, Ryanair expects to carry over 30 million more passengers this year against pre-pandemic levels. Other budget airlines like EasyJet are making positive noises on volumes as well. In the online travel retailer space, you have On The Beach, which we're pretty bullish on. It expects volumes for its three-star holidays to exceed pre-pandemic levels this year. So just a couple of examples. The feature mentions a lot more companies uh, in both positive and, and negative senses. Mm. Those three-star holidays. One would presume the uh, entry-level holidays, which maybe speaks to cost of living pressures. I'm assuming they don't market one or two-star holidays, but I don't know. You mentioned the valuation of Whitbread there, and we should talk briefly about valuations because uh, there is an interesting point in the piece about how some things have changed for companies. They're not back to normal in every regard, specifically with regard to debt they've taken on and therefore which valuation measures look most appropriate nowadays. Yeah, so I spoke to uh, an HSBC analyst, Joe Thomas, for the future, and he argues correctly, I think, that when we're thinking about um, travel valuations, we should be focusing on enterprise values instead of PE ratios and share price movements. And that's really because a lot of companies in the space have fundamentally changed since pre-pandemic times in terms of taking on more debt or refinancing. And, and thinking about which sort of travel subsectors look particularly attractive, I'd, I'd point to the airlines. Um, we think the market has priced in two week an outlook uh, for the airlines. International consolidated airlines, EasyJet and Jet2, we think are particularly cheap in the context of strong demand, which is combined with supply and manufacturing problems, which are, which are supporting pricing. As mentioned, we, we like Whitbread uh, in, the, in the hotel space, which has an attractive valuation as it grows market share. Again, as mentioned, like on the beach, a valuation drag has been removed there through its recent distribution deal with Ryanair. Elsewhere, we also like W.H. Smith's valuation as the company grows in the US, and we're still bullish on train lines despite it having a bit of a pricier rating. Mm. I think as that run-through shows, there are many strands to the travel sector and many listed companies in a lot of different areas, which we do cover in the, the piece. Uh, the real question is, of course, the extent to which this rebound can continue. Maybe before we get on to that, or maybe Alex wants to get on to that, I'm going to turn to him. Alex, what are your thoughts on uh, the travel sector, the rebound, some of the individual companies in the sector maybe? Yeah, well, I suppose on the first point, on the question of... Uh, so Chris mentioned, and I think you did as well, Dan, the, the revenge spending, which I, I suppose um, we are still... Uh, I, I, I suppose we're still understandably using the terminology of the post the post-pandemic world that we've, you know, we're, we're in. I, I suppose the well, the big question this year for travel stocks is: Are we now past revenge? Are we, in other words, has has the pandemic set in chain a kind of behavioural, definitive behavioural change in consumers' attitude to spending a bit more on airline tickets on their holidays, prioritising above all else because the experience of 2020, 2021 was so defining that it now um, it n now provides a bit more security to the airlines. The, the big question, I think we've talked about it a number of times on the podcast, of course, is when it comes to airlines, how what security looks like for those businesses in all the other things that they can't control. Arguably, they can't really control consumer spending either, which is one of the reasons why it's um, uh, it can be a tricky sector to navigate. But, you know, competition is, is something which dogged, um, the, is, always dogs the airlines uh, and their, you know, the the limited foresight they have on, on some very, very expensive overheads, fuel and, and you know, just, I mean, if you look at any part of the businesses of, uh, of, of some of these companies, there are perennial issues that um, that never really seem to get resolved, you know, labour being another one. But I suppose, and, and you know, I, 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 just before we came on, I had a look at a couple of the net, the net margins of some of the airlines. It's interesting how how post pandemic. And I suppose the comparison is always going to be with twenty nineteen, what it was, bef you know, before everything went pear shaped. It's, it's just looking at the met the net margins and which companies have tried to re establish after the horror years uh, a, a real buffer for their business. Um, and it, it, you know, just uh, is, there is quite a lot of variation there. So some are still 
in the clearly in the um, competitive um, investing for for growth mode, whereas others, and I, I mean, we often come back to Ryanair here because it, it has managed to play the game when it comes to airlines better than many of its peers, which has pushed ahead with net margins expected, you know, this year and next of 14 to 17, which is quite a step up from the world before um, the pandemic. So um, are some companies benefiting from um, a, a, a shift uh, uh, in, in, in consumer attitudes? Yeah, probably all of them are. Uh, are some turning it into higher levels of profitability? There also seems to be a case for that as well. So, um, um, yeah, but I mean, there's obviously lots more we can talk about within the within the sector. And uh, mm. On that note, Chris, would you agree with that assessment? You know, is it more about pockets of opportunity now? And uh, I'll also put to you the, the question of, you know, the rebound continuing, which you do talk about in the piece. Analysts are quite cautious about the months ahead they probably were last year too and those expectations were exceeded but there are some structural trends at play too which Alex has just alluded to a few of them yeah so as you suggest analysts expect revenue growth to slow um, in in the year or two ahead which isn't actually a surprise given they're, they're trading against very strong comparatives when economies reopened after the pandemic you also have um, the impacts of lower inflation on on pricing as well as revenge spending, there are some other factors to consider. It actually supports a bullish long-term outlook for a lot of these companies. Um, you have a different, a very different approach to work-life balance in the post-pandemic world, um, as evidenced by the home working revolution. You've got an ageing society uh, in, in Western nations, which actually supports tourism and related consumption. There's also more of a focus on experiences, although I'm not sure the data is really there to... 100% support support that trend, but it's a, it's a point of debate. So I think, yes, it, it is about pockets of opportunities now, and the feature tries to get into that across various subsectors, picking out the best opportunities. I think in terms of valuation, there's, there's still a structural argument, especially f- for the airlines, as I get into in the piece, right, where I do think the market is, is too gloomy and there are some big opportunities. Mm-hmm. I, I also think... It- as I spoke about at the top of the show, when it's been raining so consistently, such a long period of time, that really supports people's uh, uh, desire to go away even more than ever. And and I do kind of subscribe to the, the thought that the pandemic and the revenge spending will continue indefinitely insofar as people have the financial capability to, to make that spending because of that long memory of the pandemic and, and thinking about the things that people missed and what they want to do with their lives in general. However, you can't really base investing, as we've said many times before, on broad brush assumptions like that. It always comes down to individual company fundamentals and how they differ. So I think that makes perfect sense. As I say, that is the cover feature this week. There are a lot of sectors covered in there. So do pick up a copy or have a look online if that has whet your interest. Now, though, we are going to turn to our other feature this week about interest rate cuts and how investors can learn from the past or maybe not learn from the past when it comes to what has happened before uh, in terms of market movements at times of interest rate cuts. Before we get on to the uh, current state of affairs, because as ever, this is a movable feast, uh, Hermione, you wrote the piece. What, what does history tend to tell us about market performance in and around a rate cut cycle? Generally, it would tend to be pretty good, I would assume. Yeah, I mean, if we look at past performance, it's definitely much better than in rate hikes. So it's good for stocks because if we have rate cuts boosting the economy, that should boost earnings and firms should benefit from lower borrowing costs as well. It should be good for bonds as well because coupon payments suddenly start to look more attractive as rates fall, driving bond prices up. So investors could see quite a good total return from income and capital gains. But we have to be careful because rate cuts don't happen in a vacuum and central banks certainly don't cut interest rates when the economy is doing really well. They do it because they're worried about the economy slowing or inflation falling below target. So sometimes we see rate cuts happening in a recession, which is a bit more of a challenging environment. So it's worse for stocks because we've got a subdued economic background, although returns do tend to be positive. And bonds can do well as well in that situation if we see a bit more safe haven demand. This is a really interesting point at the moment because in the UK, we're technically in a recession, 
although I suspect it's probably already over. But the US economy is looking very strong. So we've got a really, really interesting issue at the moment. If the economy is doing well, inflation is still above target, as it is in the um, euro area, the UK and the US at the moment. Is there really much scope to cut rates at all? And this is what markets are really grappling with at the moment. Yeah, we are in a situation similar to last year at the moment, aren't we, where last year it was a case of coming into 2023 expecting rates to have peaked and then it turned out they took several months more until that scenario emerged. Now we've got a situation where a few months ago uh, investors were really anticipating a lot of interest rate cuts this year. Already we've seen those the timing of those cuts push back Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in January, markets thought that the Fed would be cutting in March, which has turned out to not be true. They're expecting 1.5 percentage points worth of cuts by the end of the year. And there's been a huge swing. So markets have become a lot more pessimistic now. And um, when I checked this morning, it was on a knife edge whether we'd see cuts in June or July. And they expect about 0.75 percentage points of uh, cuts over the course of the year. Interestingly, the Fed hasn't really changed its tune the whole time. So they They've issued quite consistent projections saying they see about 0.75 percentage points worth of cuts this year. But it was disappointing data on inflation that has probably made markets pare back their expectations to such an extent. And how about in the UK? What's the uh, the situation on the domestic front? Well, the UK um, market pricing is actually suggesting a similar amount of cuts over the year and starting in June. I think there are two really interesting things to look out for. The first is that in August, the Bank of England will publish new forecasts. So some economists think that the Bank of England might actually want, kind of like for safety's sake, to wait until August when they've got a bit more data and they can be more certain about where they think inflation is going. The second point is that Bank of England economists expect inflation to fall to the 2% target very soon, but then pick up again over the course of the year. Not all economists agree that that's going to be the case. Some economists see inflation falling and then falling further over the course of the year. So we could actually see much steeper rate cuts than markets are expecting if that does play out. The interesting thing, to go back to the point you made about the beginning, about the underlying state of the economy, is that as opposed to last year, this year, certainly in the US, you've had this huge repricing of interest rate expectations. And yet, shares, stock markets, the US market has continued to do really well. So heresy as it may sound, maybe there's a question A of whether the timing of the first rate cut or how many there are actually matters that much at the moment, certainly for the US. And also, the question of, is this because the US economy is actually doing pretty well, we have as it seems so far, achieved a soft landing and no landing scenario. And actually investors are much more focused on on that aspect. The fact that rate cuts have been pushed back is partly because the economy is still doing well. There's no sign of higher rates having a deleterious effect at the moment. You know, are both these things now uh, something that investors have to consider rather than being focused as we all are journalists like myself, especially focused on the timing of the rate cuts and when they'll arrive? Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think the backdrop really matters. So this week we saw a spike in Treasury yields, which seemed to reflect some data suggesting that the US economy is really quite resilient. And we had some quite hawkish comments from Fed rate setters. So the 10-year Treasury yield actually shot up from about 4.2% to nearly 4.4% over the space of just a couple of days. If we do see an increase in the risk-free rate, in theory, this is bad for stocks, but I think it probably wouldn't stop US markets from rising further because it all depends, as you say, on why yields have risen. So if they pushed up again because we saw some kind of supply-side shock that was going to mean higher inflation and higher interest rates, that would be bad news for bonds and equities. But I think that's not really what we're seeing here. And I think if we've got high yields because of signs of US um, economic resilience, that's actually quite a nice backdrop for markets. And it probably won't do anything to sour the all the enthusiasm for AI and its kind of transformative effects that we're seeing at the moment. Mm. And there's certainly, albeit not to the same extent, there's certainly more positive economic indicators emerging in the UK and Europe as well. So maybe a little bit of the same story there. Alex, I'll bring you in a final time on this topic. What are what are your thoughts on uh, the question of interest rate cuts? Yeah, always. I mean, it's just two points really. The 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 first was, I suppose, um, we've always got to be careful. We about conflating, you know, for example, the S&P 500 with the US economy and, you know, the FTSE 100, even more so when it comes to the FTSE 100 and the UK economy, because they're not, they're not always the same. And one of the reasons we should be particularly attentive to this, I think, is that 
there are, there might be some aspects about the, the something like the S and P five hundred when you consider consider it and how it relates to the broader economy, which may be becoming detached from um, what we what we you know what we look at when we look at GDP growth and, and things like that. So you know increasingly and this has been the obviously the, the narrative we talk about all the time it's the s p 500 is made up of some highly near monopolistic sectors and businesses which you know are very good at sort of digesting competition they have asset models which are not necessarily reflective of the average business so definitely something to think about and, and the second point was i mean it's a re- really interesting point i thought um hermione made in the piece saying that you know the average cycle of cuts that there are something like a two percentage points worth of easing within the first year of rate cuts. And obviously that is something not many people are expecting currently. But it is a very fluid outlook. And I think the main the the main decision I would I would argue that investors probably have to think about is are we going to be staying in a an elevated interest rate environment for the coming years, whether that's you know four percent to Two percent plus, whatever, and 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 not to think too much about the timing because no one's getting this right. No one can really call the pace and uh, I suppose steepness of cuts at the moment. So maybe that suggests that we are, you know, we you know, interest rates going to be high, hanging around for a little bit longer, and maybe it's a little bit better to think about, you know, the kind of five year returns rather than how um, things are going to play out in one year because as ever like markets seem to be detaching sometimes from the economic story and it makes it for very confusing um following and investing i'm sure but um but but yeah the longer picture might help food for thought as always unfortunately though we have come to the end of time today that is the end of the show so thank you very much to alex to hermione to mark to julian to chris and to our producer maddie apthorpe we'll see you next time on another companies and markets show